welcome to Sarah TV studio. Yeah. We are so glad to have um, you today, sir. What's your perspective on the June 12, 1993 um, election, sir? In 1993, I was a journalist with the Guardian newspapers. And my responsibility was to cover the military, to also cover politics in 1993. Now, let me say that 1993 uh, was a learning point of progressive elements, reactionary elements, uh, students' movements, labor, with a common goal to end military rule. Because as of 1987, we need to understand the background. As of 1987, the cop of Babangida was full. He had committed so many atrocities. There was the killing of Delegiwa, which up to now nobody has been able to explain in November 1986. There was also the, the killing of his best, you know, uh, one of his best friends, Major General Vatsa, that were alleged to have planned a coup. Ten officers, fine officers who are shot dead in spite of global outreach that they should not be killed, including prayer mounted by Shino Achebe, uh, you know, Wale Shoyeka, and all members of uh, you know, the literary community. Then we also had a lot of repression, the Okoba killing. You know, several people from the same family, the same father and mother, were wiped off you know, by policemen. There was also the killing of the Daudu brothers, which took place in Oshodi, that led to a lot of riots all over. There was a clean of four students at Amandu Belo University in 1986. The, 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 the policemen went into their hostels, brutalized them, raped them, and then four students were killed. Then, even on the realm of economic you know, affairs, Babangida has collected the IMF loan from the World Bank, which ended up you know, making more Nigerians to be poor. A lot of industries were, you know, had to leave the country. The industrial sector of the country was, uh, was attacked. So many, many people that were involved in production were forced to flee the country. Many, country, many companies relocated into Ghana. Many countries relocated into Zambia, leaving Nigeria because of the exchange rate and because of the structural adjustment program put in place by Babangida. And that led to riots in 1989, where over 200 people were massacred on the streets of Lagos, Kaduna, and everywhere. And the Babangira's response was to further, you know, increase his temple of repression. You know, I remember that the NLC, for instance, was, was banned. They put in an administrator in place. The National Association of Nigerian Students was banned. Labor movement and also the progressive forces were attacked. The student movement, for the first time, began to see the upsurge in, in, in armed courtism. Armed people were coming, armed people were coming to enter into campuses, attacking students, killing them, you know, um, you know, kidnapping them, you know. So it was a kind of a, a, an atmosphere of fear and trembling. So by 19, and in 1986, Babangida announced to the whole world that he was going to leave, you know, the stage by 1990. That was in 1986. And that there will be democratic government in place. In 1990, he started talking about, about extension, that he was no longer ready to hand over power to civilians. So that brought you know, the progressive force together, including some reactionary elements who are in the political class. And at that time, there was a military coup led by Gideon Oka as a kind of re response, you know, to resolve the national question, which was a major problem at that time. And 45 officers were killed in just one day, you know, without uh, legal representation. They were killed, massacred, and their, their, their bodies buried in shallow graves. And then there was a very terrible incident, which happened, I think, in September 1992 where 168 military officers perished. The plane took off at in Lagos here, and three minutes after, you know, it perished. And I remember I was in the Guardian, that when Babangira and Ahomu were going there to inspect the wreckage, they were laughing. We took the picture at that time and put it on the front page of the Guardian. They were laughing. Those, those soldiers were left in that plane for several hours. They bled to death. And up till now, nobody has made any attempt to probe that Ejibo. You know, plane crash. You know, so there were so many things that happened under Babangida's regime that people felt, look, enough is enough. So by 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 1991, when we came up with a, a you know with a kind of transition program with two political parties, Social Democratic Party and National Republican Party, 
though the Nigerians were saying that those two parties made the Nigerians to unite. But in actual fact, that was not the, the, the agenda of Babangida. The agenda was to narrow the choices of Nigerians into only two options. The signed and perfected by Babangida, the form and content of those political parties were put together by Babangida. So a lot of progressive forces, the masses elements, were edged out of the two political parties. So when you now conducted this election, it was clear that Babangida had no intention to hand over. The first transition program contested by people like uh, Falai, um, uh, Yaradua, General Yaradua, he cancelled it midway, shifting the goalposts in the middle of the game. Then when June 12th election came again, Abiola and Tofa, suddenly, at the, you know, just a few hours before the election, you know, he got a contagion saying that the election was going to be counted. But the election went ahead because Professor Wozu stood his ground. But that election was designed ab initial to fail. So when Nigerians now noticed that Babangida was not ready to leave the stage, then a lot of people came together. There were a lot of progressive forces. At that time, our, our organization was a campaign for democracy, which had labor, students, uh, uh, and media organizations, you know, uh, NUG, progressive wings of so many organizations, market women. And I think it was a monumental uh, struggle that took place all over the country and eventually brought the military on his, on his knees. Not totally, because when Babagina was living in 1993, he said he was stepping aside. He said it on national television that was stepping aside. That means that they were not ready to hand over. He put in a surrogate, uh, General Sonia Basha, who turned out to be a more vicious leader. You know, who, I mean, ran a campaign of terror. You know, fear and the anxiety, you know, were imposed on Nigerians. Mm -hmm. And then the resistance continued until eventually uh, that we were able to get um, um, you know, uh, Abasha off the way before we now have a democratic transition in 1999. Thank you very much, sir. Um, on the date of the annulment of the June 12, 1993 yeah. election, where were you? I was uh, one of those media people covering the election. So I was covering uh, Ikeja as is here, you know, the military barracks, because I was supposed to be voting at the military barracks. And then, so I was, you know, moving from one place to the other, monitoring the election, and then trying to take uh, reports which were sent uh, to the media. So uh, what I saw was that Nigerians came out in large numbers. You know, they were so anxious, you know, to edge out the military. Even in the cantonment here, you know, Abiola won. In many military installations, in many, many, many military barracks, Abiola won the election. In Kano, Abiola won the election. So for the first time, Nigerians united, irrespective of religion, irrespective of ethnicity, behind Abiola, which was not the best of all the progressive elements at that time. But of course, it provided the shade. And Nigerians rallied around because it was the only option you know, that we can use as a peg to get the military out of power. Great, sir. Um, there were stories about how um, endangered pro democracy activists sneaked yeah. into exile through um, what is known as um, Nadeko roots. Yeah. Can you tell us about the journey into this um, exile during this period, sir? Well, um, at this time, uh, before 1993, there had been people going uh, into exile. You know, uh, people were either forced into exile, like uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Wilmot of Amandu Bello University, like many other people in the academic community were compared to leave. There were also people who left the country who were economic refugees because of the economic repression. They had to leave the country. But I think towards the June 12th uh, election and after the election, the repression became more intense. And people had to leave the country passing through Kutono. At that time, we had a, a house, you know, which was kept, you know, uh, in Ghana, in a place called uh, Labadi. So if you are coming in from Nigeria, that place was managed by people like Dapolo Yomi, Chido Onuma. You know, they were, they were there. So when you are coming in, leaving the country, you know, through the, the bush path, that's the first place you go. They dress you up and then you prepare to go to know uh, the next place uh, uh, they are going to go into. So I think um, um, there were about at least at, at least three major routes that people need to pass through if you wanted to escape. You know, we have the major uh, semi border. So if you pass through that place, it was a great risk. Either they collect a lot, lot of money from you or if they discover that you are, you know, uh, one of the, a member of the uh, pro-democracy movement, you will be arrested and then bundled back to the country. So we cannot forget the role played by a lot of the ordinary masses. People are, you know, using people like Shoyika, for instance, use Okada to cross over to the to the next country. A lot of people, you know, uh, had to escape through means that were provided by 
our progressive elements who had escaped to Ghana and we are still in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. I was in Ghana, I was in uh, also Ivory Coast. Uh, and we used to travel at that time without passport. Or you travel with a fake passport, which was legitimate. But that was the only way you can escape, you know, through the, pass through the border. I remember we went for a conference in uh, Ghana. And then we didn't want to pass through the, the border. Myself, Bamidi Laturu, Shima Obani. And then uh, Shima Obani had to uh, disguise like somebody selling oranges. You know, so as to pass through from the Nigerian border to, uh, from the Nigerian border to Benin Republic. So, and then, uh, you know, if you pass through the border, there's no way they will not identify you. At that time, Shima Obani was General Secretary of Campaign for Democracy, which was the major organization at that time. I was supposed to have a conference in Ghana to be coordinated by people from the ANC, you know, teach, teach you about tactics of uh, public mobilization. So there was no way we could have passed through the airport. So we had to use the Nadeko route. And I think it was successful because we were able to at least, you know, um, create a lot of decoy to pass through uh, that route successfully without being caught. Um, during this period, were you, were you ever arrested, sir? Yeah, because there is no way you can be perfect. Uh, my arrest happened, it was by accident. There was a certain journalist, uh, Dr. I mean, it's now Dr. Abou Shadibou. He wrote a piece, how to actualize June 12th. And then he was passing through a chaotic Oshodi. Very chaotic at that time. And then he had this piece of paper on him, you know, with the title, how to actualize June 12th. So it was about, it was going to Vanguard newspaper to publish the article. Then so, suddenly, somebody just stopped him. In the crowd of in over one million people, I showed was it was so thick at that moment. And he said, look, let me see what you have inside your bag. He collected the bag and handwritten about 21 pages. This guy read it from beginning to the end. When he stopped Umi Abu he had a pistol on his hand. He said, look, I represent the Director of Military Intelligence. Can I see what you have in your bag? He collected it and read it to the end. And the last sentence said, Nigerians must harness the potential in their midst to liberate themselves. So immediately he saw, he said, okay, so you are one of those people causing trouble in this country. Follow me. Two weeks earlier, there was a, there was a bomb explosion at Ikaya Cantonment. So we didn't even know they had stationed a lot of state agents, you know, in Oshodi. But some of these bombs were thrown. In fact, they were actually perpetrated by Abacha himself in order to blackmail the progressive forces. So they took Bumi Abu Shade away and then kept him for 20 days by the SSS. After 20 days, he was moved to the Director of Military Intelligence. So after he was released, the campaign was going on, journalists for Democratic Press were all involved, organized journalists for his release. But while they were questioning him, they never, they never knew he was the publisher of June 12th magazine. I didn't say it. So in their own, you know, uh, you know wisdom, the limit of their own uh, intelligence, they could not or they didn't know that was the publisher of June 12th, whereas they were looking for the publisher of June 12th. Uh -huh. So when he was released from detention, he came to the Guardian newspaper to meet me and said, look, I'm free. That time there was no phone call and all that, no, no cell phone. I said, look, I have a good story. So let me interview you and then we'll write about what happened. Myself and Abolisha, they actually attended the same secondary school. So we had known each other for a very long time. So I, I, I wrote a piece. In that interview, he revealed to us People that were kept in detention, they, were, they, they, they tied them heads down and then they put fire under them. People like uh, Moshud Fahemiwo, people like one Major Onyea. The offense of Major Onyea was that he attended the bad day party of the American military attaché. Then the ADC of the year had been arrested, nobody knew. So he met and a lot of Lebanese that were accused of supporting progressive uh, democracy movements. So when he gave me all these stories, I said, this is a very good story. So I went and wrote the story. It came out on a Sunday. Then Major Mustafa called the, direct, the director of military intelligence, Kone Omenka, on Sunday. So look, Omenka said he was in the church when he got that phone call from Mustafa. That, this person that you have released, did you know is the publisher of June 12th magazine? Because I put it there that it's also the public. I thought they knew. So I just put it in my story. So when the, the, so when they read, they said, "Okay, we must go and look for Adewale Adewale." So they sent in some five soldiers who came to the Guardian. They came on a Monday, so I was not around. I was supposed to have a total ball the second day. So, but some people came to tell me, the security men at the Guardian, to to hit me that look, soldiers are looking for you. You better escape. I look at it. What have I done? This is just a small story. So, and I didn't want my editors to be arrested in my place. So on the second day, I went to 
the newsroom. As I was entering, the then editor, Fred Owawa, it was Kingsley. Kingsley was in France. Kingsley Osadolo, he was in France. So Fred Owawa was the one deputizing. So myself, uh, Fred Owawa, Femi Kusa, and Ladi Bunola, that was how we went to, you know, DMI. When I got there, I was detained, and then they left. So they were asking me, in fact, I was left for almost five hours. Omeka would just come and smoke. People would smoke, almost about 10 people. They just, the whole place was smoky. They didn't ask me any question. You greet them, they don't answer. So I knew they were waging psychological warfare against me. So they didn't begin my interruption until around 1 a.m. And they, they, they kept asking you 10 questions at the same time. Before you answer this one, they bombard you. With them. That was the day Delegiwa, I mean, um, Kudirat was killed. So I could, overhear, I could overhear them, you know, on, on uh, you know, passing on uh, military information about the movement of uh, people taking Kudirat to one hospital or the other. I could over, overhear them talking about, you know, how Kudirat be shot and all that. I was, you know, right there with the uh, Colonel Omega. And then they brought in Megan here and said, look, I should deny that he was ever arrested. And right there, deny that I should go and write with the joint. I said, I'm not going to, I was, in my mind, I said, I was not going to write it. So around when they when I was released around 2 a.m., they said they were going to follow me to my home. They asked of my address. I gave them a UJ address at Adeola Street, Ashomolu. Because if they had followed me home, then my problem would have been compounded. In my house were about seven people being wanted by <laughs> soldiers. Shimao Baniv, uh, Urutu Douglas, uh, Chris, all of them packed in my house. I was a bachelor there. So if they had followed me home, the pamphlets that I wanted to distribute, the campaign material, everything was stocked in my private home. So they, they said they should follow me home. So one, one captain he do was to lead that delegation. So as soon as we stepped outside, Colonel Omeka had left. That was around 2 a.m. So then Colonel Omeka came back again and said, look, leave this guy. He's innocent. Uh, he, he, did he say, he said, it's about, he's, he's not a Nadeko person. Leave him. It's not, it's not part of the Nadeko. He's just a journalist. Let's leave him. There's no need to go to his house. I felt so relieved. So by the time I was left off the hook, when I got home, Bumi Abori Shade, that had been released, he was right in my house. I told him, say, look, how many years do you have? Take off. They are looking for you. They asked me, they asked me really, do I know you? I said, I don't know you. I have to deny to save him. If I told them we attended the same secondary school and all that, it would have been a very terrible time. I would have been compared to go and look for him. So from there, Abori Shade, was assisted by one of the foreign missions. He, he traveled to Ghana. He went to that same house we are talking about. From Ghana, you know, he was taken to US, where he had his PhD. He's an associate professor now. But you know, the irony is that the dream of Abori Shadi has always been to have a PhD in life. So you could see sometimes how things work out in life that you never planned for. <laughs> so he has a PhD. And I was a lecturer at Afe Valor University, but he has returned to the US. He had all his education in the US. And right now, is in the US. So I had that very bitter experience. So I was compared to be coming every day to DMI, you know, but they never ventured to come to my house. Though I had, had to, when I came back, I had to dislodge, you know, the house. Even when I was taking some of the pamphlets to go and throw away, you know, at a dustbin somewhere, the police stopped me on the way. Hey, what did you have on your head? I said, they are, they are, they are, just, they are just waste because we had been trained that when you keep those materials, put dirty things on top. So I had a lot of rotten things, you know, cow dung put on top of it. So immediately they smelled it. They just said, oh, go, 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 go. But under, there was a lot of pamphlets described as subversive documents by the So if they had opened those things and saw those things with me, it was 5 a.m., you know, the, the patrolling vehicle, they just told hey, where are you going? Look at it, then they, you know, they smelled it. They said, okay, go, go, go. I said, the thing I waste to. They said, okay, go, go away. If they had taken their time to look underground, it would have been a very major problem for me. Wow. So I think, um, you know, it was a very traumatic experience, but I was one of those people that said I was not going to go into exile because we needed people here to be the full story and so we'll be campaigning for. And you may want to know, as a journalist, why I was interested, why was I interested? If you don't have democracy, there's no way journalism can thrive. So I felt journalists should not just be observers. We should be participants in the campaign to chase away you know, uh, military, because it was also in our own interest. Thank you very much, sir. Um, fast forward to June 6, um, 2018. President Muhammad Buhari shocked a lot of Nigerians by um, um, by declaring June 12 as, as a new um, Democracy Day, which was formally May 20, May 29. What was um, what, what thoughts came to your mind when this um, statement was issued 
by um, President Muhammad Buhari? Yeah, um, the former president, Jonathan, and uh, Buhari, they share, if you, if you find them sharing uh, a program together, then there should be suspicion. Remember that Jonathan actually wanted to name uh, University of Lagos after Abiola. So then suddenly, Buhari came to and said, you know, June 12th holiday. So it's like people have been looking for a way to feast on June 12th to score sheep political points. I don't, I don't think there can be genuine reconciliation until we find out and punish those that are responsible for the death of Abiola. Those that were responsible for the death of his wife, Kudira at Abiola. Those that were responsible for the death of Tunde Oladepo, who was shot, a journalist of The Guardian, who was shot in Abel Kuta. Those that were responsible for missing journalists, like Chine Duofaro of The Guardian newspaper, who disappeared and up to now nobody could trace him. So you cannot be talking about peace when there's no justice. So I think people are just trying to score political points. People want to win over the Southwest. So I don't think this idea of June 12th holiday is born out of genuine interest for the, for the masses. Because if they're actually interested in the people, it's not about Abiola, it's about restitution, it's about justice, it's about liberty. But we have a lot of cases of injustice that are yet to be redressed by successive regi uh, regimes since 1999. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Um, finally, do you think Nigeria would have been a better country if the June 12th elections was not um, annulled? I had no illusion that June 12 would have resolved the Nigerian contradictions. Because we have to be very honest with ourselves. We knew Abiola, if at any time there were, there were riots in Lagos by Nans, they used to attack ITT, owned by Abiola. He was generally perceived as a friend of the, of the military, as a, you know, as, a, as, a, as an imperialist, you know. So, um, you know, that was the kind of garbage he had on his back until June 12 came in. But I think June 12 redeemed him because he stood with the people until his last days. If June 12 had been revalidated, we will have moved slowly forward, but definitely it will not have been a movement backward. I don't think the general contradictions will have been you know, resolved because the ruling class you know, actually will be the beneficiary of June 12th, the main beneficiaries. You know, but we will have had democracy since 1993. So know how, know how we will have made a lot of progress than the progress that we have made now. Let me also add that the conflict that we have all over this country now, you know, Boko Haram, um, 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 courtism, Islamic uh, province of West Africa, is, they, are, they are all products of the, of the manipulation of the military, you know, during the era of 27 years of military rule. Because people's psyche have been brutalized, and people think the only way they can express themselves is through violence. And unfortunately, the present democratic system has not been able to actually deal with the mindset through pro uh, provision of the essentials of life that can make people to have confidence in the political, uh, in the political process. So we'll continue to engage the, the, the process as journalists, at least to ensure that we can uh, try as much as possible to minimize, uh, minimize conflict, peace, and, uh, and uh, peace building and conflict uh, resolution. So that that will be the basis for us to be able to have a better and prosperous uh, country.